Denver Sports presents the Mile High Hockey Podcast with Mike Evans. Presented by Fort Comfort Gutters. Now here's your host with the latest on the burgundy and blue, Mike Evans. Hey everybody, welcome on in to the Mile High Hockey Podcast. I'm Mike Evans. Great to have you here with us as we embark on another week of uh, Avalanche Hockey coming down the stretch here. Getting ready for the playoffs. And a couple of takeaways from the uh, last game that they played since our last podcast, the 7-4 win over Nashville. Again, a slow start for the Avalanche. They fall behind a couple times, 3-1, 4-2, and end up putting on the afterburners and roaring from behind and beating Nashville. By the way, not insignificant that um, Nashville taking on after that incredible stretch of hockey where they went 16-0-2, points in 18 straight games, that they've now lost a couple of games in a row as of our speaking here. And two games which they gave up a combined 15 goals. So maybe Nashville, they're, they're, they played themselves into a playoff position, but maybe a case where they expended so much, are they having enough in reserve to be able to uh, to make a run here during the playoffs? It's possible. We'll see. You know, again, it's you're looking at the possible matchups for the Avalanche in the first round. Still a lot of things can happen. Very fluid situation in their own division. The Avs in Dallas. Also what's going on with the wild card spots. So it's, it's something you pay attention. You watch every day. If the playoffs were to begin today, this is what's happening. But uh, the Avalanche able to come from behind to beat Nashville and all that firepower was on display as they roared from behind to get the win. But let's start with, with what is potentially something to watch here. And Hey, I'm a talking head, right? In sports, I'm a, I'm a sports talking head. The only thing I like better to create controversy and debate than a quarterback controversy is a goaltender's controversy. And do we have the makings of one here with the avalanche? You know, one thing that's been clear throughout the season, and I I feel like I've gotten pretty good over the years at being able to listen to coaches, especially if I get a chance to hear them a lot and start to kind of read between the lines at times with what they're saying, what do they mean type thing. And I've gotten the sense all year with Jared Bednar that his critique of Alexander Georg- Alexander Georgiev has been it's been positive, it's been good, but it's been somewhat muted. His commentary on uh, Georgiev, a lot of yeah, he was good, you know, he was he was okay, you know, not not. Not negative, and I, I don't want anybody watching this to to think that I'm saying that Jared Bednar doesn't like Alexander Georgiev. All I'm saying is that his commentary regarding Georgie throughout the year has been somewhat tepid. How's that for a word? Whereas in the case of Eustace Ananen, he's been very complimentary of Ananen. And... Are we looking at the potential, especially after what happened in the Nashville game, when Georgiev gets off to a really rocky start, gives up the three goals in the first period, uh, gives up a fourth goal, gets called for an unsportsmanlike penalty, and is yanked. On and in comes in, avalanche, roar from behind, they get the win. Are we looking at a potential goaltending um, controversy? Maybe controversy is not the right word. Are we at least looking at the possibility of the goaltending duties being fluid as we go into the playoffs. I think it's a fair question to ask only because we saw it play out a couple of years ago when they won the Stanley cup with Darcy Kemper and Pavel Francis. So we saw an avalanche team, an avalanche coach that had no problem going with different goaltenders throughout the playoff run. And even though the playoff goaltending wasn't a strength of that team, it was good enough to win a Stanley cup. You know, I raised the question, but now let me answer what I think's going on. Alexander Georgiev is is the is the guy. I think I think they like Ananin, but they like him, and all the commentary, um, all the analysis of Ananin comes from the role that he exists in as a backup goalie. That within his role as a young backup goalie. They like this. They like these characteristics. They like this upside. I think they like him as a prospect. I think they like him in his backup role. But I don't – I think it's a a stretch to say 
that what you're hearing when they talk about Onanen is a legitimate threat to Georgiev. I just, I don't think we're anywhere close to that. I think Georgiev is the guy. I think they're ready to ride with Georgiev, ride or die with Georgiev, at least until it's becoming obvious in the playoffs that it's not working with him. But I don't, I don't sense any goaltending controversy. Um, I think that in the case of, of Georgiev, that they they want to continue to 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 build him up. It's it's weird, isn't it? This is just an observation. It's amazing to me the kid gloves with which teams feel that they have to handle goaltenders. Goalies are they're wacko, man. They're a unique brand. They are a unique breed. They have some quirks about them that just make them stand out from everybody else on a hockey team. And you're it's funny because you're talking about a a, a position, a player who plays a position that's so crucial, especially come playoff time, so crucial. And you would think that the the mental strength that it takes to be able to play that position, you would think it would make guys impervious to uh, looking over their shoulder. But man, goalies, you got to treat them with kid gloves. And a guy like Georgiev, you wonder, can you can you put too much pressure on him to make him feel like He's being pushed by Onanen. I don't think you can. I think you got to be careful in that regard. So um, as we come down the stretch here, I think you're going to continue to see a, a, a pretty clear uh, uh, delineation as to who the starter is, who the backup is, and those roles will not be blurred, blurred at all. Blurred? Blurred at uh, at all. So, But it's, uh, it's fun to talk about. It's fun to push the idea that Onanen maybe is somehow – pushing Georgiev and that we could be looking at a, a real goaltending issue uh, come the playoffs. I, I think that I feel very confident in saying that once we get to game one, round one, it's going to be Georgiev, and he's got to play at a pretty poor level um, to get to get knocked off and and to have the, the role taken over there by on and in. The, the other good thing is, is that, you know, one thing we learned about the Avalanche playoff run, Stanley Cup run a couple of years ago, um, you'd love to have great goaltending, but it's not necessarily a must. The Avs proved that you can win a Stanley Cup with less than stellar goaltending. They did it that year. I'm not saying it's a model that I would like to see them try again. Uh, I don't want to go back to that well too often, but at least they did show that they can get it done that um, that way. So uh, something to watch there. A couple other quick uh, news and notes, observations with the Avalanche. Casey Middlestack continues to be a seamless addition to this lineup. How about the way he stepped in for Val Nachuskin on the power play unit, scored another power play goal the other day. Uh, Middlestat is um, is looking like a real, real find, a real plug-and-play uh, answer to what they've been searching for with that replacement to Nazem Kadri uh, as that second-line center. He is he stepped in flawlessly. And so we talked about this on the podcast a little bit last week. You know, it ultimately will come down to what he does in the playoffs, but these new additions continue to look strong. I, I, I think it's it's funny. The the one thing that jumped out at me, if I look at uh, what's going on with the Avs, yeah, they had a really good win the other night, but uh, in, in case you missed it, you know, while we focus on these uh, new additions and, and the, jo- the job they're doing, um, how about Ross Colton? Only playing uh, nine minutes and 22 seconds the other night. How about Miles Wood only playing 1240 the other night? Um, some some low ice time numbers for those guys. And these are two guys that are being, well, I mean, these guys were riding high on the second line um, just, just the other day uh, or earlier in the season they were on the second line. So, you know, just something to watch for. And, you know, Jared Bednar is in a position where he's, you know, constantly being able to send messages and the uh, one way that you can send a message to a player is with ice time. And sometimes the best way for us as fans to get a sense of how a coach feels about the way a player is playing, the faith he has in him, the responsibilities that are given to him, is uh, is look at the ice time. And in, in a couple of cases, those numbers are a little low uh, for those guys. But, um, you know, something to watch. But uh, the Avalanche have some nice depth right now. And, uh, you know, maybe it's one of those things where some guys are not uh, having to play as much because the top guys are playing so well. But uh, just something to watch. Just something to watch. But uh, the Avalanche, still no Val Nichuskin. 
Uh, hopefully to get him back here very soon. I think we're, you know, it's funny. We're looking at the same thing with the Nuggets and Jamal Murray. At what point is it an injury? At what point is it something to be nervous about as a fan? Or is it simply we're coming down the stretch? There aren't that many games left. Let's be prudent. Let's be smart. Let's take a look at the big picture. And let's just kind of be willing to shut these guys down for the time being, make sure they get completely healthy and they're ready to go for the playoffs. And then maybe once we're getting close to the playoffs, you know, you get a chance to get them back in for a couple of games, see what happens. Um, Gabe Landeskog, you know, still keeping hope alive, I guess, right? You continue to see some of this footage, some of this video of him out there skating. Uh, People who have watched Gabe uh, last year do some of this. And again, this year say that he seems to be doing more than he has in the past. That's good. That's encouraging. It's still a big leap to go to get to the point where you can look at him being out there game one, round one. You root for it. Man, who wouldn't root for it? What a story that would be. You just got to hope that everybody is 100% clear um, that he's able to come back and do this uh, without having a a setback. Uh, everything that I've heard about this injury, it's one of those things where it's not your traditional injury that you can rehab it while the injury is still there, that this is an injury where you got to let it heal 100%. It has to be completed 100% before you start to push it at all because the slightest setback gets you almost back to ground zero. So uh, let's hope that I'm sure that they're, they understand the investment. Five years still left on Gabe's contract. They understand that this is a guy's career. Gabe understand that it's his career. I would think that they would not do something as big as throwing Gabe Landeskog right back into the deep end of the pool, having not played hockey in almost two years, throwing him out there. Here you go, round one, game one, NHL playoffs, go. I would hope that they wouldn't do something uh, that big unless they were absolutely convinced, the team and Gabe, that it was the right thing to do and that it was okay to do without any real fear of um, setback. You're always going to have a fear of a setback, but you know what I mean. There's there's, there's some things that you just can't account for that, hey, everything made sense. All the boxes were checked. Let's go. Oh, man, a setback. That's unlucky. Versus something like, hey, the guy hasn't played in almost two years, and we didn't give him a whole lot of ramp-up time. Wow, we're shocked that he uh, suffered a sup- setback. It, there's a difference, and hopefully – there's none of that when it comes to a possible, possible uh, Gabe Landeskog return. So uh, we'll see what uh, co- happens with the Avalanche uh, this week. As we're talking here right now, they play uh, Columbus uh, on Monday and then a couple days off uh, until they play the Wild on Thursday. Then another date with the um, Oilers coming up on Friday. It'll be, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Avs' last uh, back-to-back of the uh, season. So coming up on uh, Thursday and Friday against the wild and Oilers, a quick three game road trip uh, before they come home and, and uh, basically finish out at home with, I think uh, four of the last uh, five at home. So that'll do it for this edition of the mile high hockey podcast presented by four comfort gutters, your comfort, our priority. We'll see you again later in the week. 